hired me for my first libertarian job. And he's also the reason that uh, we, he was my partner basically for the last 20 years. So oh, wow. most of them, most of them. Wow. wow. The stuff we did at Downsize DC and so he was there. Yeah. Perry is awesome guy. I think I met him through a libertarian page on Facebook at some point when I was kind of breaking out of the Republican phase that I was in. And yeah, he was, he was my very first official guest on recorded conversations. So he uh, he's me. an, he's an interesting guy. He really is. We talk brilliant. Well, read. Of, yeah, but he's fun to talk to too, because he's not your typical serious libertarian, right? He has such an imaginative mind, open mind. And yeah, we talked about aliens and UFOs and oh, no, he's conversant stuff. in that stuff. And it's, you know, this is fun for me because having known him for very nearly 25 years now, uh, he's, he's come a long way in his own evolution and, and his own thinking. Mm -hmm. And one of the really neat things I'm attracted to people who think and change their mind because they thought they did research and homework and their mind was open, not so open that it falls out of their head, right? But open enough that, that if new facts come in and they realize that their case wasn't the right one, that they'll reverse course, they'll yeah. repent of their previous direction, right? Right, and repent, change your mind. <laughs> yep, he's done that. He's done yeah. that uh, several times. And so that's, I find that a, as a very attractive human trait. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's uh, it's frustrating when you can't find someone to engage in like that because you feel like you're beating your head against the wall because people are so rigid in their beliefs. And I think the, the, the rigidity in beliefs right now is is kind of what's making our society seem so crazy is so many people are, what is it that, that uh, backfire effect where they dig their heels into the ground right. and they stand firm in what they believe and nobody can tell them they're wrong. And as humans, we should be able to embrace this understanding that we're evolving creatures. And there's always going to be a new experience that's going to come into our, our lives that all but convict us to have to change our mind. And it's when we deny that, that I think we, we get into a lot of problems, but um, that's a rabbit hole we could go down. But first I want to start with you. So, okay. Cause I was going to jump right all over that too. <laughs> oh, well, well, we can totally dive back, but I want to let the audience know who you are and what you do and what you stand for. And so Jim, if you could just kind of give us a little brief synopsis of who you are as a person. Uh, well, most people would start by talking about what it is that they do for a living and what their career and is. And I'm blessed in that I'm able to do something I really care about and make money. I was able to match passion with obligation. And that's even and, best. Yes. Yes. So uh, I work on libertarian stuff. That means philosophy. Fortunately, I get to do that. That means I get to do a little bit of politics. Not as pleasant to me as that used to be. And I help other libertarians uh, do their jobs and be more productive. And yeah. I've been, I've been really fortunate to be able to do all those things. And so I, you know, I sent you my bio and it's kind of long and involved, but if I try to do this extremely quick, I'm the, I'm the president and co-creator of uh, downsizedc.org. We go by the name agenda setters by downsize DC over the last oh, nearly two years now. And uh, we, uh, there I co-authored uh, the one subject at a time act and the read the bills act. And we uh, have an innovative strategy that we're using to try to advance just a handful of pieces of, of legislation uh, in Congress. Uh, did, did, that was my full-time job from 2004 until 2000, the end of 2018. Uh, it's still there, but I've uh, since taken on other responsibilities. And I'm also the editor at large for the Advocates for Self-Government, home of the world famous, uh, world's smallest political quiz. And I am helping them develop and build out uh, their resource and, and gain resources uh, to continue to build out new tools uh, for libertarians to use to communicate basically a message of human respect, which is the philosophy I help try to advance as a colleague at the Foundation for Harmony and Prosperity. And that tied in very nicely with the work that I was doing with the aforementioned Perry Willis at the Zero Aggression Project where we were trying to introduce people to a world that lived on, in, in, under what is called the zero aggression principle. The idea that we shouldn't use initiate force, use excessive violence to get things done, whether it's personal or political. 
Now you have the ZAP, the zero aggression policy. And so that is kind of a rift off of the non-aggressive principle that some libertarians kind of adhere to. Is that what it is? Or is it taking it a step further? You know, it, it's interesting. Normally, I think Perry and I, in our normal circumstances, in a shorter conversation, would say just simply yes, but uh, really no. And and why I say no is because Perry had the insight to recognize that there is a uh, we should have what is called consumer controlled governance. And. He said, and I agree with this completely, that you have more power as a consumer than you do as a voter, as a citizen. Yeah. And this, this is just fundamentally obvious to people. You go in and you complain about something as simple as, you know, they didn't put the right condiments on your burger, your special order burger. You can actually be pretty demanding in terms of what you want to have done to fix that. And they will be highly responsive up to a point in attempting to satisfy your concern. And even you can still be a jerk after the whole thing's over and you can still go leave a bad Yelp review, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day. And reputation matters a lot in the marketplace. And so no company wants that done to them. They, and they operate under a philosophy called the customer's always right. But there is no similar thing. There's no voter is always right. There is no mm -hmm. citizen is always right. Uh, you get the one size fits all approach that was voted upon uh, in, a, in a mob rule sort of way that mm -hmm. gets imposed on you and violence is at the core of how that system works. So the, the term that I coined for this and that we were using over there was post-statism. It's a world after government. I, I, I tend to believe that what the founding fathers gave us was a major leap in, in human progress, but it wasn't the end of evolution. It wasn't the end of history that we still have kind of, there's an empathetic arc at work. We should be moving in a direction where we have more respect for one another. We don't aggress against one another. Uh, the forms of governance that we need should be, as Perry described, consumer controlled. And that's how, and I label that a post-statist view. It means that we are, this is a future looking view. This is a world of hope and opportunity uh, that we could have available to us. And that I believe is what we're trying to get across at the Zero Aggression Project is this post-statist view of a consumer controlled governance system. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I tend to agree with you. I think we can see the relevance of the, the consumer influence that we have right now taking place. Most recent events where we can look at Spotify, we can look at Carhartt, um, we can look at all of the protests that people do for corporations, right? If you, you find out that Apple is is, is using unethical practices to create their, their products. You can say, look, I'm gonna look for a cell phone that, that doesn't exploit labor in other countries or that doesn't exploit resources in other countries. And we can make that individual decision. I think that's really important. But do you think maybe we take it a little bit too far, especially when we look at cancel culture? I understand we have the consumer choice and we have a lot of influence with what we consume. But do you think some people maybe exploit that and take it to a degree where you're no longer just acting on an individual choice, but you're floating into that mob rule? Definitely. And I'm going to take a, a radical position that differs from what I think I see a lot of, you know, I would describe myself as a small L libertarian, where a lot of libertarians are on this at this hour. And they've been very much caught up in the conflict, the conflict machine, as I prefer to call it. And in, in so doing, that one of the tools that they believed was legitimate was boycotting or censorship. Mm -hmm. um, so censorship means and boycotting means and canceling means that somehow or somebody has to be punished for their views. And I don't fundamentally think that that's how you get things done. I don't believe shame works. Mm. I think shame is, is fear is, is the number one problem. Shame might be number two. And I think the reason that we've seen, you mentioned the backfire effect to me earlier. I think part of the reason we see the backfire, let's say to masks and, and vaccines, regardless of what side you fall on this, I think there's been a fundamental misunderstanding that if we take people's autonomy and we tell them, we try to shame them out of their autonomy, that we've created a formula that we just know we have so much so, uh, sociological and psychological research on this subject. If you want to talk about doing the science, we know that that's going to cause a backfire. That's going to literally build resistance in. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about boycotting for just a second, because I think I have a unique take on this. I think boycotting represents an initiation of force. 
So one of my sons uh, just graduated from college. He's working at Chick-fil-A at the moment. Chick-fil-A has in the past been a lightning rod for certain types of protests. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of people see it as a place to go get a good sandwich or they have actually some pretty cool salads there, right? Mm -hmm. And you go there and you get your food and the service is incredibly efficient and friendly. But if we say, okay, well, it turned out that at one point in time, their founder gave money to a cause I didn't believe in. And I want to get even with the founder. And you decide that you're going to boycott his company. Do you think that that changes the founder's life profoundly? For example, will he be driving a different car? Will he live in a different house? Will he lose his house? Is there anything that he's really going to lose in, the, in that process? Or will it be regular people who served you at the, at the drive through for example, who said, my pleasure, every time you ask for something? Which person is it that's going to be at the front end of that? My fundamental problem with boycotts is, is it creates a lot of collateral damage. And the people that will be harmed the most in it were the ones that had the least power over what it was that caused the offense in the first place. So I believe it violates the zero aggression principle. Yeah, I'm, I'm here with you. I feel the same way. I often think that I can't, it, it's not only that, it, it would be so overwhelming for me to keep like an ethical checklist of every CEO for every corporation that I've ever patronized. Yes. And then to remove myself from the participation of that, I would, I would be an obstacle to the goods and the services that I actually need based on, I think, a really self-righteous approach to shopping, yeah. which is Sounds exhausting too. It, it is, it is right. And I know a lot of people have even often cited like verses from the Bible where they're like, well, if you know that the meat that you're buying from the market was not properly killed, then you need, and it's like, we have all this information. So people hold to that. Well, now, you know, and so in your knowing, if you're choosing not to do anything with what, you know, then now you're a sinner too, or you're guilty by the extension of the participation in the consumption. And it's like, don't people ever just want to just live their lives and not worry so much about what this CEO or this executive or this creator has said at one time in the past? Because then I think what happens is we eliminate the potentiality for grace and yes. forgiveness and understanding. 100%. Yeah. And 100%. We, and I, it, Boy, the example you just cited too is kind of funny. It's an example of not reading to the end of the story. Yeah. Because in the New Testament, Paul makes clear and it's made clear to, through the story of Peter that there's nothing unclean, right? right. Going to Chick-fil-A and eating their sandwich. I, I'm not saying that's the necessarily the healthiest decision. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Please let me be clear about yeah. that. But uh, it's not unclean. There, you're, you haven't engaged in some lack of virtue by consuming the food. This is literally in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And the reason that sometimes we would still choose to forego it is because there's people that we call the weaker brother around us who they see us eating it and their faith is the one that gets rocked as a result. But, uh, you know, if they understood the freedom that we've been given, they wouldn't have made that decision. I mean, it's, 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 there's an irony in what you just said that just so profound. I just couldn't let it go by. No, thanks for that. I appreciate that. So, <laughs> Um, one thing I wanted to touch on was you said the one subject at a time act that you that okay so it was um, HR 202040 and it was reintroduced by Russ Fulcher and now I'm just I just want you to kind of break down what this bill is so the audience understands why this is actually a really important bill. Archimedes said if you give me a lever long enough at a place to stand I'll move the world. And we see we have written three bills that we think would have high leverage over what the government can and cannot do. We are downsized DC after all. Uh, would, and the, the one that has got the most attention that I think has the most potential to go the furthest soonest is the one subject to time act. It's introduced in both the Senate and the House with 10 co-sponsors in the House at the moment. And we've had more in, in a previous session. And the reason I think, I'll get to the reason why I think the, the members of Congress would be attracted to it, but let's describe the bill. It's the one subject of a time act. And so what it means is that each bill has to have a clear descriptive topic or title limited to one topic, one subject. And then everything in the bill has to conform to that. Now, this is an act asking a whole lot, 45 state constitutions. This isn't a rule. This isn't a law. This is in their constitutions, 45 states have one subject provisions in their state constitution. 
roughly half the states in this country have ballot initiative where citizens can put something on the ballot and nearly every one of them has a one subject requirement. And in like my state, for example, the attorney general looks to see whether or not you met the criteria of, of having one subject, right? He's asked, he or she's asked in to take a look and see, is this really one subject, okay? Um, so this isn't really hard stuff, but for some reason, Congress makes it hard. So I grew up uh, watching, you know, Sunday, you know, Saturday morning cartoons and, you know, today I am still just a bill, right? You know, and it's, it's schoolhouse rock, right? But it's not true. Routinely, things that would have no chance to pass in the light of day, that would not be able to garner public support, that would not be representative in a democracy, are stuffed, clustered in with sure to pass bills. Sometimes they're hidden in the pockets of those bills so that they're not even there to be seen. And then they're passed in that, in that way. And the reason that representatives going home to their districts would care about this is they're running for re-election and their opponent will say, well, did you know that so-and-so voted for a tax increase? Well, that was a little thing that was buried in a big bill. Or do you know that they voted for this or that buried in the big bill? And a lot of times these are bills that they have to vote for. For just an example, the troop appropriation bill that needs to be done every year, the, the, the defense bill. Who wants to be opposed to the troops? Who wants to vote against defense, right? right? And that, that these places, the transportation bill and some of these others, there's really pernicious stuff hidden inside these bills. Uh, and they don't have any choice but to vote for them to keep the government open and moving forward. And this is a routine trick that's pray, played by lobbyists in conjunction with uh, the leaders of the various committees and the leaders of the parties, and it's wrong. And so this would make it illegal. Now, last piece of the puzzle. It's not enough that we have a rule for Congress because most people recognize inherently that Congress is the most lawless institution in the land, ironically, yeah. and that they won't follow their own rules. They won't enforce their own rules on them. And so we made a law. And what that means is in the event that they do not uh, follow the provision and you, uh, Danielle, find yourself in the dock. You're being charged with not paying a tax that they left uh, or, or a, a levy that you didn't uh, follow one of the regulations that they had. And there you are on trial for it, or you're being charged with it. You can show the evidence to the judge that the law was not passed following the one subject provision. And the judge will kick the case to the, to the curb with impunity. It's out. Hmm. No more charges against you. So they can go ahead and pass all the laws they want, not following this provision, but they're not enforceable. And that's the key issue. And so that's how the one subject at a time act works. And so this is one of the first steps in holding Congress accountable for the, the laws that they're imposing on people for all of all of the the bullshit, quite honestly, that they're getting away with. This would be one step towards holding them accountable and actually maybe getting them to have to what, what what pay a price or just lose the opportunity to submit bills? I mean, what does that look like in the end? It means that they, 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 if they want to be effectual, they're going to have to follow the procedure. If they yeah. want their law to stick or their tax to be enforceable, they're going to have to follow the procedure. And, and this, Daniel, the great thing about this approach is it's transpartisan. And what I mean by that is that almost everybody that we've talked to over the years agrees with this. And they're more amenable to it when their side is the minority party. Yeah. And so every, both of the major parties do experience being the minor party at one point or another. And they should want this provision in place for those times when that event happens. So, uh, but regular people get this. They understand this. Like the re regular voters who aren't part of the system, they, they inherently get something's wrong here and that we should have actual representation on each piece of legislation. Right, I agree with you. And, and regular people want their, their, their Congress and their representatives, their state senators, they want them to be held accountable and they want them to have to be able to report back to them to tell them what they did for them. And that is where we have a little bit of power. I don't, I often have always said, I don't think I have any power in the vote for a president, but when it comes to more local voting, um, we do have the power. And so I think that would be a great way to just help establish this kind of accountability between citizens and our elected officials where, okay, hey, I want you to support a bill like this. I would urge all the listeners out there to push their elected 
representatives to also want to back this bill specifically. Um, we could throw term limits in there too at some point. That would be great and beneficial to everybody. Um, I mean, because I was under the impression, for instance, that Nancy Pelosi was going to be done. And here I, I hear she's not. And I think that's a really devastating thing for, for many people, especially me. And uh, on the other side of the ocean, what the queen is celebrating 70 years in power. And I think that's generations of people who have held this power and have affected how many different generations of people. And we're mm -hmm. still over here feeling powerless, like our vote doesn't matter. So that would be, I, I just want to reiterate a great first step. And that's what we should be asking our elected representatives for to so, at least one bill. So you give me one more thing. You give me one more opportunity to add another layer to this that I think is actually pretty important, but you know, usually, I usually don't have the time to do it. And I thank you for this. There's a lot of people out there who are for a line item veto. Yeah. They would like to have some kind of control or constraint put in place to keep some of these pernicious things from getting, from happening. Mm -hmm. Problem with a line item veto is it once again gives the executive branch, the president in particular, a disproportionate amount of power over the Congress. And there's supposed to be some kind of balance there. And this isn't a, a, the way that the system was designed. He's not, he's either vetoes or doesn't a, a given bill. And there's reasons for that. But if you want the effect of a line item veto, this is the constitutional or the ideal way to go about it. If everything has to be sent up one subject at a time, that means each thing had to be debated. Each thing had to be legislated. Each thing had to be voted upon. And then each thing can be subject to its own veto. And so the next tax, the next law doesn't get passed unless we actually have some cultural consensus, frankly, that got us to that point. And if it, if it didn't, you know, this, this stuff that's getting through on the slimmest of margins is actually a pretty dangerous phenomena because people start to recognize that this is raw, unbridled power that's being imposed to take away their happiness and their autonomy. And they begin to react very, very negatively to it. Whereas if there's a wider cultural consensus on a subject, even if you're on the wrong side of it, you know that your real job is persuasion. We lose that when we start losing everything by one vote, by just the scrape and everything's a slog. And we're arguing about how ballots work and, and we're arguing about uh, how all of the system is working because we're su suggesting that somehow or other, and both parties are doing this right now, both the major parties are suggesting that the system has been rigged. Yeah. And it's, it's unhealthy. So I've heard a lot of libertarians say, if we just vote libertarian, we wouldn't have this problem. Do you think it's that cut and dry? No, because I've met libertarians and it turns out they're human <laughs> beings. Yes. And human beings do things that are ridiculous and stupid and petty and mean and libertarians are not immune to that. So no, I don't think it is that simple. Now, do I vote libertarian when I'm given the opportunity? Yes, I do. And libertarians are some of my best friends, right? But uh, uh, no, I don't want to go so far as to say that it would be easy and that it would automatically make it better because the power, there's, there's two problems fundamentally with our system. One is what Frank Herbert called the, what, what he labeled as this attraction to power, right? The wrong people want the power. Mm -hmm. And then Lord Acton comes in from the other side and says that once that power is acquired, it tends to corrupt people, right? So it gets kind of, you know, the wrong people come in and then what's left of them tend to get corrupted. And the problem actually is the power. How many things require, this gets back to the consumer control discussion we had a few minutes ago. How many things re actually require power? Do we all have to eat the same sandwich? Do we all have to drive the same car? I'm not, you know, you and I both ended up wearing blue today, but they're different shades of blue, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we all, we got to make our choices. You live in Minnesota, I'm in Ohio. Like we all got to choose what we're going to do, who we're friends with, what we're going to eat and all that sort of stuff. And all that happens without checking in with our neighbors. Imagine if you wanted to buy a big screen TV, but you need to get a permit from your neighbors yeah. before you're allowed to do that. I mean, this is essentially how the state works. And it's, it's involved in far too many things that frankly could be handled. Uh, I, I mean, in some of these cases, fairly obvious ways in a consumer controlled fashion where the real uh, customers that have the power are the ones that are making the decision as opposed to having a fight with one another at the ballot box. Mm, yeah, that's a good point to bring up. Um, so one thing that I was really surprised by um, was how many people actually identify at, with libertarian principles. And it's a growing number. And I think we've seen that number increase 
exponentially, especially after the last election. I mean, I know I have from, from my perspective, I've seen a lot of people kind of move more towards this libertarian ideas and in step with the non-aggressive principle and in step with basically letting people live to, to just quickly define what a libertarian is. Could you give the audience just some ideas, maybe some, some political positions, maybe some ethical positions, maybe to just help people uh, realize where their, their, their principles and their beliefs really are like line, line, lining up on the spectrum. Could you give us kind of a brief definition of what okay, a libertarian so we, is? Versus yeah, I can do Maybe that. even if you can juxtapose that with this term voluntarist that a lot of people are confused by as well. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack there. I want to start on kind of a philosophical level because okay. everyone is essentially a libertarian. They all make different exceptions to that rule. That's really, so the base position is libertarian. And but what I mean by that is, is two things. One, every time, everybody has issues that they don't want the government involved in. Mm -hmm. Everyone. I've not met any ex personal exceptions so far, right? Mm -hmm. You know, some people say I want the, uh, the government out of my bedroom. Others say they want it out of the boardroom. There's, other, there's various places that people suggest they don't want government. Everyone. They believe those decisions belong to them. And so... The other, the other aspect that's really important here is ends and means. You know, you've heard the phrase, the ends don't justify the means. Yep. Anytime you hear somebody raising a means discussion, saying, hey, wait a minute, do we really need to use force in this situation? Do we really need to do it this way? Do we have to be so hard about it? Do we have to be so inclusive? Does it have to be a mandate? Does it have to be a tax? Every time you hear somebody raising those kinds of things, you're hearing their libertarian spirit. So a libertarian is someone who is concerned about, at, at the end of the day, the central thing is force. Does force need to be used to get this done? And the libertarian position would be to tend to, a strong tendency to say no. And if you're a voluntarist, you would say, we always say no. And you would say that because in a voluntarist, from a voluntarist perspective, you believe that all relationships that one uh, has were relationships that they chose. And that includes who the regulators are going to be, who's going to provide their security services, who's going to provide their social services. They are going to choose those things for themselves. And if the relationship isn't working out, they're going to have some process for being able to divorce that relationship and move on to another one, choose someone else to provide that service to them. And that's what a voluntarist is at the end of the day. All relationships, including the ones that govern me, have to be voluntary. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to choose them. I don't get stuck in them, for example, just because I was born in a given place. And, and, and so to compare this, you know, there's, there, it's typical for people who are more on the political left, uh, less in recent days and just the last couple of years, but still, you know, some, some tip, somewhat typical for the people on the political left to agree with libertarians on social issues. And, and that's kind of a live and let live, a tolerance approach. We have this whole kind of progressive woke stuff that's going on right now that's not tolerant and they aren't honoring things like free speech and the Bill of Rights anymore. And that's very, very scary to me. And then it was typical, again, until very recent years for people on the right to uh, agree with libertarians on economic policy. That was, you know, at least lower taxes, if not eliminating taxes, cutting the size and expense of government fewer regulations in the business sector so that we were able to flourish and prosper. But that started to shift too. There's, there's, there, there's increasingly a nationalist bent showing up over there. And I'm concerned about both because the dialogue has diminished over time as well. And, and, but we have to have kind of at the base a fundamental libertarian approach in order for us to have a healthy dialogue. There's gotta be an agreement that these things aren't necessarily existential and that we do care about the means that we're using to get to the ends. It's not just about beating our opponents. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I see that too. I just recently read an article, I think it was from the Mises Institute that, that really kind of called out Republicans and uh, pointed a finger at, you know, you say that the Democrats are over here all for the big government, but you're also the party of big government. And I think, I mean, in my mindset, I look at both parties and I think they're both for this overreaching government 
to control every micromanage every single thing in our lives. Mm -hmm. And it's coming to a point where a lot of people are saying one party's going to implode, the other party's going to implode, this party's going to split, this party's going to split. What, what do you see happening in the trajectory of say, even the next presidential election? Do you think that both of these parties are going to continue uh, reaching for bigger government and more control? Or do you see a split, a demise? What do you think is happening here? Okay, so they're both going to keep reaching for more control. Uh, recent survey data says that the fewer and fewer people want to associate with them. They are both in decline. Um, they are, they don't seem to have any intellectual, philosophical, or moral breaks. They don't stop. They keep going towards their own destruction. And I think that they are a proxy for a fight that most Americans don't really want to have. But if it keeps going the way it's going to go, I think that we end up with a, a split. I think we end up with a national divorce. I think, and I don't know what that looks like entirely. It's not necessarily violent, by the way, but we may just simply go our separate ways to some degree, and or to a great degree. Again, it's too it's too early or too soon to tell. No one knew, you know, a month before it happened that the Berlin Wall was going to come down, and then it just did. Yeah. And so it's one of these things that builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up. And there was a build up. There was a story behind that whole thing. But then it just happened. And so I don't know what our Berlin Wall moment is, but there is a real social division right now between people. And they are fighting these proxy wars on, on, the, on the home front, so to speak. And the social media giants have made matters worse. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe social media is a bad tool. I'm actually a big fan of it. But the way that this, the, these tools have been managed have actually, they've preyed on, again, this goes back to another conversation we had earlier, they've preyed on people's fears, right? Yeah. Like if you think that, that people are out to get you and then you see evidence that they're out to get you, how is that going to, how are you going to have a rational conversation at that point? How are you going to bring that person back? Well, see, they're, you know, I told you they were out to get us. Now they're not even letting us talk. I think this is, I think we're in a, a, a a strange, difficult situation as a country right now, really. And, and, and there's some evidence that this problem is worldwide. I mean, look at what China is attempting to do to its people and how it's, in, it's moving into Hong Kong and taking away their liberties. I mean, I think these are, we, we're in pretty serious times. I, there's, a, there's a part of me that's, that's concerned that these times rhyme a bit with the 1920s. Mm. And we know what happened in the 1930s and 40s. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a little, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit pessimistic. I wasn't, I was the guy that everybody used to call all the time and say, oh, Jim, something went wrong. We just lost this battle on Capitol Hill. Give me a good, a bit of good news. And there was always something to point to. And I think you have pointed to one thing. So if you're looking for the silver lining to all of this, there is a degree to which people have checked out. There is a degree to which they've said politics is, is dirty and it doesn't matter or it shouldn't matter or it matters too much. And the fact that that's begun to happen and that people have begun to wake up to the fact that when they don't follow the rules, the system collapses, it requires their active compliance in order to work. We've had people whose eyes have been open and that's the silver lining I see. And that's the hope that I think exists. So yeah. is it set in, set in stone? I'm not coming on to prophesy a split. Is it set in stone that's going to happen? No, no. Maybe people are waking up as a result of this and maybe it has to get darkest before we get the dawn. I think the trucker convoy in Ottawa, Canada is a sign. Uh, I hold it as a sign of optimism for what citizens are truly capable of when they unite, when they put all their political bullshit aside, and when they really realize what's at stake, what's being threatened. Um, we're seeing that, what, what I think I just heard news that there's an, a convoy organizing in Finland and also I believe in New Zealand and scheduled to begin organizing here in the United States. And I think that goes back to that topic of where consumers really do have the power um, to the point where they're going to withhold the, the goods and services if need be to make a stand and to show people who really have the power. Uh, I am optimistic in the same degree that people are waking up. I'm seeing that as well. Um, and what I would urge and encourage though, for other people is we don't need to focus so much on having the right talking points and the right debate arguments. We need to be open-minded to having an actual dialogue with one another, having a conversation 
I believe it's only through conversation that we're going to establish any kind of connection. We're going to be able to really authentically share our experiences with one another, come to a greater understanding and see that, you know, your neighbor's not your enemy, even if he's hanging the Biden flag and you're hanging the Trump flag or whatever. There's always this common ground that we we we, we should be helpful to find rather than finding another reason to divide ourselves against something. So I'm with you on that. That's so I want to just throw one more point in there, and that yes, is that please. it's easier to have that conversation right now in late 2021, early 2022, than it is in the fall of 2024. We will be, the, the country will be back at each other's throats at that hour. Yeah. And so this, these wide gaps we have between these, these, these every four-year elections give us an opportunity to breathe and give us an opportunity to talk. And hopefully people are taking the, this time to plan, to try to figure out a better way to make 2024 and even 2028 better than 2020 and 2016 were. And maybe a better result can come out of that. But in the, but right, so I'm, I'm encouraged because what you're seeing with the truckers and what you're seeing and the friends that you're, that you're beginning to meet and stuff online and so forth, I feel like the same thing's happening here. I'm having new and different types of dialogues like the one you and I had online personally. You know, I had that same dialogue with a couple of other people. There are new conversations going on and I'm finding people remarkably open to these ideas. I see them looking, they're searching. It's almost like they're on a quest. They want an explanation for why all this is happening and how it's happening. And they want to have not simply these surface level conversations. I'm finding more and more people that want to go down and start to get to kind of some of the spiritual roots of these things. That doesn't happen. We, we kind of lose our mind during these elections and it's mm -hmm. too late to be having. And those conversations aren't welcome when the, when the vote is happening. It's full war at that point. But right now in the off season, there's a real opportunity, especially when we're all kind of depressed by the results we keep getting. Yeah. Oh, I hear you on that. So one thing, I think you wrote this and it was on your downsized DC blog. Um, something that I actually found to be a little bit shocking because I didn't think about it. And it said, you wrote, human nature is a real hurdle. The two, key, the two points are key. Human beings are not motivated by good news and progress. Most people are motivated by hate, fear, conflict, and drama. And now for me, I'm on the other side of things and I, I catch myself, right? I get scared. I'll listen to Glenn Beck or I'll listen to Dr. Malone on Joe Rogan or whomever. And I think doomsday <laughs> prophecy, Jesus Christ, you're scaring the crap out of me. Is there anything I can do? So I sit there and I'm like, what can I do? And I have to talk myself into a more optimistic outlook, right? Because I don't want that fear to take hold of me and grip me. But this idea that most people are motivated by fear is very scary because when you're in a state of fear, psychologically speaking, reason has gone out the window. Mm -hmm. And so that means people are motivated by irrationality. And what does, what does our media spend most of its time covering? Anything Stuff that, that you need scares to be scared you. Yep. Anything that you need to be scared of. And that and is- And why are people addicted to watching it? Why, are, it? why do people tune in? Why do they spend their time consuming it? They seem to have some drive or need to get it, right? To get that fear dose, find yeah. out what they're supposed to be scared of. Yeah. Fear is their dopamine and their serotonin now. It seems yeah. to be. Yeah. It's that, that's a comfort zone that we get locked in though too, right? And I think that goes back to, I mean, just this, this idea of the ego. The ego likes comfortability. The ego likes what the ego knows. And this has become, especially over the last two years, we've all been gridlocked in the state of panic. And it's almost like we're hypnotized by it. And now we need that to be our new normal. I need to be scared because anything that doesn't feel scary feels really weird. And it's like, how do we change that narrative? And how do we change that direction and mindset for people to move them from being comfortable in a state of fear, which I think most people are unconscious of, right? They don't even realize that they're not thinking about it, but they're unconsciously locked and comfortable in this fear. And it's like, well, okay, so then what's the remedy for this? And if we're not motivating people by good news and progress. How can we, right? Okay, so I think there's that's a huge launching off point that can go a lot of different directions, all of which are vital and important. But I want to acknowledge, first of all, the wisdom in what, something you just said, which is this awareness that you have of it. 
So I, you know, when you, when you walk into Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous, the very first thing you have to do is admit what, what you are, what you're confronting, right? Mm -hmm. And we as human beings all have to kind of step into our own, you know, politics anonymous and say, I, I, you know, hi, I'm Jim, I operate on fear and I want to coerce other people. And we think that if we use force to get things done, that somehow or other we're being efficient, right? We start to rationalize the fear. But if we stop and recognize what you just said, that there's kind of this limbic response, right? There's this like reptilian instinct in us and it, it's, it's sparked in. <laughs> so I, I happen to conceal carry. Okay. And when I first got my gun, and it's been uh, 15 years ago now, and I started carrying it, I became very aware. You take a course before you do this. You find out that you should never, ever, under any circumstances, ever pull the gun, right? Like, it's going to change, turn your life upside down if you do it. And so, God forbid, world without end, I'm ever in a situation where I actually have to use it, right? Mm -hmm. And I began trying to ponder what else constituted self-defense. What were the escalation points up to that? It, it had... The, the unintended consequence of making me a more peaceful person. So, uh, Danielle, one of the things that went out the window right away is road rage. Road rage is an incredibly stupid thing. Mm -hmm. uh, advice for all young people starting to drive right now as they're going to their 20s and 30s and they're full of, you know, all their hormones and everything. If you do not meet the other drivers on the road and you never get to know their names, that's a successful journey, Right. I don't want to have a confrontation or the, or, or the shape of my big metal thing changed, right? I want us all to get to our destinations and never meet each other because we weren't intending to meet each other. We were all going someplace and that's successful. So I learned that I needed to tamp that down because if I get out, I got a gun in my pocket and I'm going to be Mr. Tough Guy all of a sudden. I can't pull the gun because I'm the one that escalated. I'm not engaged in self-defense anymore and I'm going to turn my life upside down. So I started looking for other avenues to try to drive towards peace and awareness of the fact that your ego, something like your ego could be the thing that triggers it, right? If somebody disagrees with you, are they really hurting you? If somebody disagrees with you, are they really out to get you, mm -hmm. right? If somebody doesn't understand something, we just had right here in the news this week, Whoopi Goldberg say some incredibly stupid and ignorant things. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are historically really dumb, okay? And there might've even been an element in, of, of bigotry in, in the statements themselves. It's possible. But should she have been punished for that? Is that the right way that we go about correcting that error? Yeah. And what signal does that send to everybody else? Was anybody hurt by her actual words? I mean, actually physically hurt. Did you lose property? Are you poor as a result of it? You got to call the repairman. What do, you gotta, what do you have to fix as a result of that, right? If you, just because you had some expression of virtue doesn't mean you were actually injured. Yeah. And so I think it's really, really important for us to recognize that ooh, it just went off again. Ooh, it just went off again. Ooh, and it happens multiple times a day. And if you stop and start thinking about that, then that conscious step allows you to begin to start to reverse that process. Okay, this is turning on. This is firing when I don't need it. And so we've talked about Perry a couple of times. He, he says, I've come to realize that this is a fairly useless thing. We're not out in the woods. We're not being chased by tigers, right? This is a fairly useless thing. We don't need it as much as we think we do, right? Adrenaline exists for a reason, and, but we, we don't need to get upset over most of the things we choose to get upset about. We aren't really being hurt, and disagreement is not injury. Mm, yes, absolutely. I'm with you on that. But see, the problem is, is who's teaching self-awareness, right? And who's leading the charge and modeling what self-awareness and personal accountability looks like? And that I think is where the problem is. And I think that's what's most frustrating for me, even just viewing the political sphere is- no but, but, you talk, but you talk about this, right? Oh yeah. All the time, right? Yeah. And this is part of what you use your podcast to do? Definitely. Okay. So the medium that we're in right now is a passive medium. And by that, I mean, the people who are listening to what we're talking about right now don't have to sit and think of the next clever thing that they need to say. They're not debating with us right now. They're not charged up and ready to go fight with us, right? They're sitting back and they're listening and they're receiving and they're hearing the words that you're saying. And so you are reaching them in exactly the right frame of mind right now with the message that you do. And every single time you turn on the microphone and bring somebody else on, or you just talk to your audience, you are helping them turn that on. 
and you're doing it in a way that is completely non-threatening to their autonomy and their happiness. And so they're receptive to what it is that you're saying. So you are providing a valuable social service in what it is that you're doing right now. You are actually contributing to the change in a significant fashion because now they are going to start to be aware. There's certain ideas that they're so spiritually powerful that once you hear them, you can't unhear them anymore. They change your life. They screw with you, frankly. Okay. They, they, they make you realize, oh my gosh, I'm not really living up to my duty as a human. And you know this inside your spirit. And I think that when you come on and you bring attention to these things in this non-confrontational way, where you're not attached to attacking their values, and you're certainly not arguing with them as people, they can go away and they can ponder and think about this. Now, is, it, is the effect as big as you want it to be? That's the real question. And the answer is probably no, right? You wanted to see more dramatic results come quicker. But I want you to know that just by sitting here having these discussions in this medium, in this way, where there is no threat, is making a difference. Hmm. Thank you for that. that. That made me feel very nice about what I do. Um, and you are right. You know, and this, this goes back to something my husband said to me, because I do vent a lot of frustration to him about how I, and I think a lot of people get caught up in this year. Like, what am I, what can I do? And am I doing enough? And am I even affecting any change? Right. Cause ultimately change starts with you. But the story my husband told me, it's kind of corny, but I love it is a, uh, after a storm, a uh, beach was lined with starfish. And so a boy walks up and starts picking up a starfish, throwing it back into the ocean. Someone comes up and goes, you can't save them all. And he says, nope, but one starfish at a time. And so I think it matters. It matters to each of those starfish. It does. Cause that's one more starfish um, that you threw back into the ocean and brought back home. But I think uh, maybe you just witnessed me not realizing uh, the power that we do have individually as people. And so thank you for that. <laughs> and um, I want to be mindful of your time here too. So before we go, um, I want I want to just kind of help people direct them towards you, Jim, because I really appreciate what you write. Um, and uh, I really appreciated you kind of reaching out to me the other day too, and just bringing to, um, to light, you know, what you stand for and what you're viewing and and uh, what your philosophy is. And so if we could, if we could just let people know, how can they reach you, Jim? How can they connect with you? And what can they do to help with your passion and your pursuits? Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I run downsizedc.org, which is where we talk about the One Subject at a Time Act. There's, some, there's six issues total that we're dealing with there, three criminal justice reform. Uh, it's, it's because it's pathetic that the land of the free has the highest incarceration rate on the planet, mm, mostly yeah. for, for victimless crimes. So we need to do something to empty the prisons. And when we get people out, they shouldn't come with a scarlet letter. They should be able to restart their lives. Um, so we, we, we're dealing with that and these three bills, the Read the Bills Act, the One Subject to Time Act, and the Right to Laws Act to change the way our government works. We have a very innovative strategy there called the 300 which is that we want 300 people in every single district of the country that we can get 300, just 300, who will agree to go visit their congressional offices in waves of three, five, and six at a time. You won't go alone. And we are using an approach we call option activism. That's our, our matching strategy to the 300 that you only have, to, you only will be asked to go once there actually are 300 people and you can go in those waves of three, five, and six. And those waves will keep crashing into the office like waves do until congressional offices relent and agree to sponsor and co-sponsor these bills. So that's downsizedc.org. I, I work for the Advocates for Self-Government. They're right now launching a new project called libertarianism.com, which is designed to introduce a philosophy of human respect as the basis for a better world that we can have. And I would strongly encourage people to check out the world's smallest political quiz at theadvocates.org and visit the new libertarianism.com website. Uh, I, the co-creator was with Perry, who's come up several times in this conversation because we both know him. And Perry uh, and I created the Zero Aggression Project to talk about what, how we can make the world uh, more responsive to your concerns and needs and your neighbors' concerns and needs through consumer-controlled governance uh, using the Zero Aggression Principle as our basis. And, I like that, uh, more responsive and not reactive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I've, I've done some, I did some writing over the last year and I may do a little bit more at a project called the, the that's kind of, uh, kind of semi going 
called the exit network, which is kind of our commentary on the media and how the media draws us into a conflict machine, basically puts us on partisan teams so we can taste the delicious tears of our enemies instead of starting to realize, instead of actually solving problems, you know, just defeating and getting, you know, some kind of bliss or joy out of that. And, and being able to recognize that's what's going on and, 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 and human respect as a solution to that. Um, on my Facebook page, I have two of them. Um, I have my personal page, uh, my personal profile, which is a little more personal stuff, but I do tend to put a lot of political stuff there. But the profile, the, the post I sent you the, the other day uh, that I wanted to make sure you didn't miss was on my public page, which the doesn't have a whole advice. lot of followers. And there I get into some more of my spiritual views. Uh, I'm a believer, but I've got some fairly unique takes on what it is that Jesus Christ did. And, and it's not the stuff that you're used to hearing in church. And it turns out that the gospel actually is good news. So maybe there is, to me, a little bit of an itch that I try to scratch over there on an occasional basis and more and more frequently as the, day, as the months go by, of actually maybe bringing the gospel to Christians. Mm, I like that. Yeah, that's definitely needed right now. And, and that's over on Substack, right? Uh, no, that's, uh, that's just me on my Facebook page. I have, a, oh, I have two oh, Facebook Oh, I'm pages. sorry. The Exit Network yeah. is on the Substack. The Exit Network is on Substack, and that's where okay. we get into some of the more media, how the media is manipulating and how politicians are using the media uh, to manipulate. So, so awesome. I'm, I'm kind of spread out thin, doing a lot of different things. I have my hands in different stuff, but as maybe you could tell from this conversation, I do think that these ideas are profound. They have real personal, spiritual things at stake. And they have, you know, socially, there's kind of a social divide. There's a, there's a breakdown in the fabric. We could have a much better world with more harmony and greater prosperity. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, I think that's what we want. I agree. I think that's a beautiful mission. I wish we had more time. So please let's, uh, let's get together again soon and have another conversation. Cause I feel like there's so much more we could touch on and I've really enjoyed this conversation. Likewise. I will make sure that everybody knows where they can reach you on all the show notes on the podcast and you can go find him, Jim Babka on Facebook. And thank you. Thank you again. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. Thanks.